Film six, take ten. Ready when you are. Okay. I believe the, uh, the, the Americans had a rather unique way of uh, interrogating Viet Cong prisoners that they'd captured if they want information or not. Yes, sometimes, bearing in mind that uh, war is a series of atrocities in many ways, and the Americans weren't any worse than uh, the communist side or uh, some others on their side, South Vietnamese. But they did, at times, take uh, Viet Cong prisoners that they had captured just at that time immediately into the air in a helicopter in order to uh, gain information regarding the positions of the communist forces. The way they did that usually would take two or three up and ask the first one the obvious questions. And uh, if he didn't answer, they pushed him out. That was documented and proved on, on uh, several occasions. Uh, quite often the second or third gave the information. Sometimes they didn't, of course. Do you remember Wilfred Burchard? Yes, I remember him very well. Met him first in Cambodia in 1964. Of course, Cambodia wasn't in the war then. What sort of man was he? I found him a very dedicated man, dedicated to what uh, he believed, uh, which wasn't uh, communism as a world order, not communism for uh, Australia, for instance, but uh, he saw communism as a means to the Southeast Asians, Vietnam uh, particularly, gaining independence, complete independence from colonial influence, Western influence, and uh, freedom for the people from the traditional feudal system. Why couldn't uh, the Australian government and a lot of Australians tolerate him? Well, there was, there was a lot of uh, conjecture that he had uh, been involved in interrogating Australian prisoners of war and American in North Korea during the uh, Korean War. Uh, on at least one or two occasions, um, that was proven to be entirely false. He had spoken to Australian prisoners, but it was at the request of uh, Australians to uh, find out uh, if some Australians were in fact captured or whether they had been killed and things like that. It was never proven that he had done anything like that. Was he quite a brave man, you think? Oh, indeed he was. He, he went into South Vietnam with the Viet Cong and spent several months there on one occasion particularly that I know of and uh, a number of other times with the Viet Cong. He was a man in his 50s then and uh, he had, a man has to be brave and tough to do that. Why didn't you accept a job for the American networks when you were working for Viz News? Um, well, I had offers on them for so over several years. Uh, but I wanted to work alone and I wanted to present the picture as I saw it. If you work for the Americans, generally speaking, they dictate the terms or they dictate the stories you cover and to a certain degree how you cover them. That is, they want to know the American involvement all the time, so that tends to slant it towards an American interest, whereas I was interested in presenting the story uh, completely as I saw it, an unbiased account from an unbiased source, which was me. And it, would uh, have been, uh, it would have been biased if you had presented it for the American network. Not particularly biased, but the emphasis would have been on the American involvement. Uh, the good example is that, of that is that many American people and Australians and others in the Western world believe, uh, because of that heavy coverage, that the Americans were fighting the war in Vietnam. In fact, the South Vietnamese army always did more fighting than the Americans. You would have earned more money if you had a work oh, for the yes, Americans. Oh, yes, of course, yes. About how much more? Double. Hmm? <laughs> that time that you shot the film in uh, Saigon of the tanks coming through the presidential palace, Yes. Uh, I believe you could have made more money by selling that to the American Broadcasting Company. I could have made it by selling, uh, a lot more money by selling to a, uh, a rival company, yes. I was, I, but I had reached a verbal agreement with NBC. Was only verbal? Yes, it was only verbal, but uh, that's just as binding to me as a written contract. You can't write a contract for everything, and I'd agreed to do that, as I'd agreed to do many th things in the past. I really didn't have a contract with anybody I worked for for 10 or 12 years. How much would an American Broadcasting Company give it to you for doing it? Uh, I'm not saying it was the American Broadcasting Company, I just said a rival network. Fair enough. Um, well, what would you uh, it, it would have been ten times what I got from uh, NBC. Yeah. <laughs> what do you see as being the, the world's major trouble spots in the next uh, five to ten years? Well, obviously Southern Africa, that's Rhodesia and South, Afri South Africa. Uh, trouble spots 
and the trouble cannot diminish. It, it has to increase. You can't see any solution to Southern Africa that will be a peaceful solution? It's possible in Rhodesia. Uh, it's moving towards a solution. Whether it will be peaceful is uncertain as yet. I can't see any peaceful solution to the situation in South Africa. The white government, the white regime, has gone so far uh, to perpetuate this abominable system of apartheid living apart that I think and I don't think they're going to give any ground on that mm -hmm. and I think there's only one way and that is a violent revolution unfortunately. The uh, South Africans of course have got the nuclear bomb or so it's rumoured. Do you think they're likely to use that if they were pushed? Yes it's a hypothetical question but I think if they were pushed too far too fast yes they probably would but who can tell what will happen in the next few years? The outside pressures may be enough for them to give a little ground. What about in terms of limited nuclear warfare in other places? Is that a possibility? Well, it's always on the cards, and it depends very much on the leaders, I think, doesn't it? I mean, uh, that was possible with uh, President John Kennedy and uh, Khrushchev in the time of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, and it's always on the cards. If you get crazy leaders, if you want to describe them that, or leaders that can be unstable. We're getting uh, more and more in, uh, countries that are involved in the nuclear club though. Do you think it's yes, almost Yes, many. They're, they're, uh, India is more or less in the nuclear club now besides four or five other countries. No, I don't think it's in inevitable because I'm always the supreme optimist. Uh -huh. yeah. Turning to, uh, to, to Africa and your coverage of Callan, which we talked about before, yes. what sort of man was Callan? Well, he was a complete schizophrenic, that was for a start. Many in his group, what we called the Callan click, if you like. Many who were in his group were worse than Cullen. I had limited uh, sympathy for Cullen in, in a sense that if he, if he had stood trial, of course he was executed in Angola for his crimes, uh, but if he had stood trial in a British-style court, Western court, he'd undoubtedly be found to be insane. A lot of his henchmen were not insane, they were just uh, mass murderers. Why did uh, Callan go to Angola in the first place? Well, he was that sort of guy. He was uh, brought up to be a soldier. He was a British paratrooper. He had been dishonorably discharged. And was there, was, there was some suggestion that he was trying to find or, or get onto the source of a lot of the diamond worth, of many diamonds uh, in uh, Angola. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's true. Perhaps he thought that there was a possibility. He was a fairly simple man in some, re in some re respects. Mm -hmm. Can you just give me the start to how you managed to get that exclusive footage of the tidal wave that hit Bangladesh? The, the oh, effect? well, uh, I arrived very early on the scene. That was the only reason. I mean, they'd already had the typhoon tidal wave. It was towards the end of 1970. Uh, but I got on the first plane when I heard that the, this was happening and I was there first. That was about the only uh, criteria, really, and there was only one helicopter flying. I happened to know the pilot from a long time back. It was a presidential helicopter, actually, and the only one relief helicopter flying. It became known as Davis's helicopter, but uh, mainly because I was there first, I guess. What about the earthquakes, uh, or earthquakes in, in Manila? You there was an there? earthquake in Manila in 1968, and I was there coincidentally covering another story. Uh, that Again, uh, the reason was uh, that I was there and no other major agencies or networks were there. Uh, of course, when it happened, I went out and immediately started filming. Many died in one, just one apartment block. 400 people died when a, an apartment block collapsed. And uh, that won me a British award, British Commonwealth Award. Mm -hmm. Although in that year, I'd taken far better film in Vietnam. <laughs> Do you think there's any place in the world that you wouldn't go to to cover something because it was too dangerous? I, I really don't know. Uh, I'm not looking for other wars to cover. You've, uh, you've had enough of war or why? Uh, it's just that I don't want to, if you become personally involved, or with a lot of friends in that sense, personal involvement, is that it's inevitable that you will stay to see what happens, I think. And that's uh, one reason why I stayed in Indochina for so long. But uh, I don't foresee that I'm going to be uh, so closely involved again. Mm. And uh, can you kids be quiet, please? Uh. Mm. 
can you draw any parallels between yourself and, say, uh, Damien Parra? Oh, only that we, uh, I think we had similar attitudes to the way the coverage should be done. Uh, Damien liked to work more or less alone uh, and do his own story the way he saw it. The, he uh, later worked for the Americans and he uh, was killed when he was working for the Americans. Uh, I happen to know through friends of his that he didn't care to work that way because they or orchestrated it too much and uh, he was unhappy about that situation.